about the easiest types of business to buy, the five easiest types of businesses to buy, um, and kind of a little bit on how to find them, how to do it. So basically, the first category would be if you're looking for more leads, there's no better way to acquire leads than to acquire a business that already has aggregated the attention and eyeballs of your ideal customer. So to acquire media, all you need to do to identify these types of companies to acquire would be to say, who's already got the customers that I would like to have? Who's already gone through the trouble and effort to get a bunch of them together? Now, that might have happened in a company, but it also might have happened with just an asset. So the types of businesses that we're looking for here or the types of assets would be anything that it could be like a whole business that that already has the customers that you want. That That is a form of media. But more than that, it's likely to be a podcast, somebody that's got a podcast that's about exactly what your customers are interested in. So maybe your ideal customer is an e-commerce customer. So an e-commerce podcast would have a whole bunch of people that were interested in e-commerce that were listening to that. And therefore, if you acquire that, then you've got media access to this pool of customers that you would like to send to your other business, right? Another thing would be um, potentially a Facebook group. We buy a lot of Facebook groups um, in the uh, for our dog business. We'll buy specific types of breed owner groups, like a German Shepherd owner group or a Dachshund owner group. Uh, for our real estate business, we'll buy a pod, uh, a uh, Facebook group that has already got a whole bunch of real estate agents in it because we're looking to have more real estate agents in our brokerage. Um, so we're just looking for the exact aggregated list of our ideal customer that exists in the form of podcast, a social media group, a YouTube channel, um, an existing business. It could be a trade show. Uh, it could even be websites that already rank uh, in SEO for our, what we're looking for. So if you Googled, um, I don't know, let's say you're I've got bottled water here. So let's say that you Googled bot bottled water and um, that there were a couple of top sites that came up for that and you sell bottled water, then you might think about just acquiring that website or the business that owns it and then you would have it. So that's why it's really easy to find media and it's really cool once you get it because now, especially with all the stuff that's going on with the death of the third party cookie, with the um, changes to operating systems and uh, that Apple has done with privacy and access, with the changes Facebook, with GDPR, with all of the rules and privacy that are coming in all the states here in the United States, um, it's really just going to be hard to get your word out to the exact targeted audience that you want. And if you already own the media, they call that first party data. Uh, just It's also known as your list. You're expanding your list by acquiring groups of your ideal customer that you can then market your marketing messages to. So that's basically why we like that. They're easy to find and the benefit is really, really big. The second category of company or asset that we'd like to buy, and remember you can buy the whole company or you can buy assets, would be one that would give us the team and resources that we would like to have for our business. So it, it's hard to do things from scratch. Like let's say that you want to start an inside sales team, but you don't have a sales force. You've never been a salesperson. You don't know anything about how to find them, how to recruit them, how to vet them, how to qualify them, how to compensate them, all of those things. But somebody else has already done it. There are companies that already have the sales force that you would like to have. When we were looking to launch uh, software development, None of us had ever done any software development team management. We hadn't gone out and found software developers and qualified them and, you know, to be sure that they're the right people or know how to monitor them to know if the stuff that they were cranking out was coming at the right speed or if it was effective or if it was going to be outdated. None of that. Like we would be terrible starting from scratch. So rather than start the software dev team from scratch, we just went out and found a company that we were already paying for uh, their software product, and we bought that. We acquired that. So we went and acquired that, and, um, and then we had a software team that could crank out software products. So whatever it is you're looking for, this is also sometimes referred to as an aqua hire. So that's acquisition plus hire. So an aqua hire where you say, hey, we need a 
person or more particularly a team that will do certain things for us. Maybe you need a media buying team. Maybe you need a marketing team. Maybe you need a sales force. Maybe you need a dev team. Maybe you need a good team of operators. Whatever it is that you need, that team has already been formed somewhere and there's a good one somewhere that you might be able to go out and identify and hire. So when you're thinking about how do I find these, you're thinking about, well, who already has that I already have in my network that I'm already working with? Who already has the team that I would like to have? Then could I acquire that company? Or is that team part of a, uh, a product group or a profit center? And I could acquire the profit center or the product that's in the product group and get the team that I want. That is really, really a great strategy for doing that. Now, there might also be resources that you want. So you can also apply this to, let's say that you've been trying to put SOPs, standard operating procedures in your business for years. And you've always meant to do it, but you're always busy and the whirlwind of what's going on is stopping you from doing that. Uh, what could you do that would allow you to acquire somebody, somebody's business or assets that have already created all these standard operating procedures that you want. We run big events. We've got thousands of standard operating procedures for doing that. So when we sold our event to a bigger company, they got all of our operating procedures, which not only can they use for our event, but they happen to own 300 and some other events. So they can take that and use those assets, that resource of those standard operating procedures there. And it could be the same with other resources. Maybe they have already got uh, something else that you want. So I would just say, like, if you're making a wish list and you say, if I could wave a magic wand and have teams and resources, um, what would they be? And then you make that list of those teams and resources. And then you say, well, who do I know that already has those? And you start approaching them about an acquisition. And again, this could be an, a, a whole company or it could simply be a single asset, a single product, a single service, a single product center, a profit center, okay? The next one would be products and services. So uh, how can I acquire, or why would I want to acquire other products and services? Well, the typical reason is that you're going to want to increase your average order value. So your average order value is how much are customers buying when they come and do their first transaction or when they do each transaction with me. And one of the easiest things that you can do to get a larger average order value is to say something like McDonald's says. McDonald's says, would you like fries with that? That's called an upsell, right? So McDonald's says, you've come in and you ordered a burger and the burger is 29 cents. Would you like the, I don't know how much burgers are at McDonald's, but let's say it's, let's say it's 69 cents. How about that? Uh, so we buy the burger for 69 cents, and then they say, would you like fries with that? And the fries are $1.10. And now we say, yes, of course we like French fries because they're basically salt on a stick that you, get, that you guys have, and we love it, right? Uh, it's all about the salt and the vehicle for salt. Uh, but anyway, so that's an upsell. If you go in and you order something and you pay, you're going to pay one price, and then somebody says, would you like something with that? That's a really great way to increase your average order value. And then after that, they probably say, how about a Coke, right? And the Coke is another $1.50. And so now you've gone from $0.69 cents to 4 or $5, and both of the things, the French fries and particularly the Coke, have a ridiculously high profit margin. So you've also increased your profit margin because the food cost on a burger is much higher than the food cost on french fries is much higher than the cost of the syrup and the water that makes up coca-cola so when you're thinking about how can i solve the problem of getting a, ha an, a higher average order value which also answers the problem of how can i increase sales which hopefully if you're profitable also solves the problem of how can i have more profit well, the way to do that is to go out and say, what are the products and services that already exist that my current customers are already buying? They're already buying, right? That's why it's easy. Because and, and, and because if they're already buying it, you don't really have to work hard to sell it. It's a, it's a logical upsell, meaning it's uh, something that's, that's nicer or cross-sell to a different kind of product. So... So how do, you, how do you find those? Well, you, you, you think about what products or services are my current customers buying before they buy my product? What products and services are they buying 
when and while they are buying my product, and then once they have my product, what additional products and services are they likely to buy, either because they've got a specific need that has the need for other products or services in addition to mine, and they're buying our product or service to satisfy that need, but they'll also buy some others, or because the product or service that I buy then creates the need for additional products to help them either consume it, to help them use it, to help them get the most from it, or because it's gotten them a step farther along in what they want to do. So that's that's really to me, and there's all kinds of things like cross sells, up sells, down sells. Um, what if they can't afford the thing we've got? Can we acquire a product or service that will be less expensive than ours? So that's a down sell. What if they buy the thing that we sell and they want to buy something else that's more expensive? That's an upsell. What if they want to buy a completely different thing with the product that we've got because it's something else that they're likely to use too? That's a cross sell, right? So all of those things are things we want to look at and we just want to start identifying and you can ask your customers the easiest way to find them out. Like if you don't already know, say, hey, do a poll. What other products or services did you buy immediately before you bought our product? What other products or services did you buy while you were buying our product or shortly before or thereafter? And what other products or services did you typically buy within 30 to 60 days of buying our product? If you get people that respond there, that'll give you new categories of products and services that you would like to acquire that you can then add on to the offerings that you've already got, which will increase your average order value. It will increase your sales. And hopefully, if you're profitable, will also increase your profit. Now, the extra added bonus benefit of this, if you want the advanced version, is think about what are the products or services that will increase your average order value that have the most profit margin and go and acquire those. And keep in mind, you can acquire a product or a service or a company that provides a product or service, uh, you don't always have to buy the whole company. Or maybe the product or service that you want to acquire is one of several products or services that a bigger company has. So you don't have to acquire the whole company, you just need that thing that you can use as an upsell, downsell, cross-sell, etc. Uh, so that's really how we go about looking at products or services. The next area that you want to think about maybe acquiring a company in would be in the event that you're thinking, how can I get a higher profit margin? How can I make more profit off of the customer relationship that I've got right now? Well, the easiest way to do that is to do something that in business school they call vertical integration. Uh, there are two types of acquisitions that you can make according to most business schools. That is a horizontal integration, meaning that you're buying for, you're, you're a manufacturer of, let's say, microphones, and you're, you are interested in acquiring more market share. If you're interested in acquiring more market share, you would be easiest, that, probably the fastest way to do that would be to buy, like if you want to double your sales literally overnight, then just go out and identify a microphone manufacturing company that has the same level of sales and customers that your current business does. If you acquire that company, then you will literally be twice as big as you were the moment before you acquired it. So that's really easy. And that's typically called horizontal integration. I don't know, I mean, vertical makes sense, horizontal probably not as much, but it's because it's a competitor, right? Now, the other option would be to do what they call vertical integration, and that is going up your supply chain to acquire whoever is supplying you with the product or service that you're using. And so a lot of people instantly discount this as a strategy because they're like, well, I don't manufacture anything. I have a digital marketing agency. So, you know, there's nobody that like, I guess I could buy the people that make the people that work. No, I can't do that. Turns out because slavery is not legal, right? Okay. So how do I do vertical integration there? Well, let's talk about the easy one first. The easy one is you manufacture, in this case, we talked about microphones. Well, maybe you manufacture that by acquiring several components from other manufacturers that you assemble into a microphone. In that case, you would do an acquisition of those parts manufacturers that were providing you with those parts. Maybe you are a manufacturer of bath bombs 
And therefore, you have several ingredients or supplements. You have several ingredients that you acquire in bulk, and then you use that to blend to create your bath bombs or your supplements. In that case, you would acquire the ingredient supplier. Or maybe you buy from a wholesaler and you resell. So maybe you buy microphones from a microphone wholesaler that buys from manufacturers, and then they represent several different manufacturers, and then you get them to give you an order based on your demand, and then there's somebody in the middle. So you could cut them out by acquiring them or going directly to the manufacturer, either of those, right? You could acquire the manufacturer, you could acquire the wholesaler, you could acquire the components manufacturer, you could acquire the ingredient maker. All of those would be up the supply chain. It gets more complicated, as I mentioned, when you think about a service. Uh, so if you have a digital marketing agency, though, there's a decent chance that you are outsourcing some of the services that you provide. So most of the time, there's either outsourced SEO, search engine optimization. There's outsourced media buying to other agencies. So maybe you're an agency that's a general digital marketing agency, and you've got in-house people that are doing media buying and Facebook ads, but you need you, you sub out your YouTube ads business. So rather than continuing to pay that supplier of YouTube ads to do the work for your customers that want YouTube ads, you just go and acquire that agency and now you have vertically integrated that into your business. So um, so that hopefully that gives you a little bit more guidance on what that vertical integration looks like in non-manufacturing environments. Maybe you have somebody that is producing content for you, or maybe you outsource your customer service, or anything that you outsource. Anything that you outsource, you just go and acquire the outsourcer, you've consolidated your supply chain. As we have experienced throughout the pandemic, a real challenge in getting our products in, the last article I read, I think this morning, said there's 101 container ships that are backed up in the Los Angeles and Long Beach port area, 101 giant container ships with tens of thousands of goods and hundreds of millions of dollars of stuff that isn't able to get to the people who need it to be able to sell it, particularly for the holidays, which is when I'm recording this particular video. So that's a challenge. So one of the things that you could think about too is maybe I can diversify the risk of my supply chain by acquiring some domestic manufacturers of the products that I want or some domestic suppliers if you're having change if you're having challenges with say uh, internet outages because you've got a team in uh, Davao in the Philippines you know I've been there I've had that right so there's a storm our whole customer support team there is out for a week while the uh, while they get the streets cleaned up right it can be a real challenge so that's, um, that's the up the supply chain. Now, the other place that you can go is down the distribution chain. So if you are a middle person, it's pretty easy to say, well, how do I cut out the middle people? Like if I'm selling those microphones that I talked about before and I'm not selling directly to the consumer, then any of the businesses that are between me and the consumer that I can acquire will increase my profit margin because right now my supplier's got to make a profit margin. But if I acquire that, I capture that margin. My distributor has to has to pay a profit margin, like it has to earn a profit margin. So if I acquire them, I get that too. So if I was making mics, there are music stores all over online and physically that are selling my microphones. Well, what if I started acquiring them? What if I acquired the online site? What if I acquired microphones.com? Don't want to know what it looks like, but I, I bet it's out there. Uh, or Sweetwater Sound, which is a huge manufacturer, uh, excuse me, a huge uh, distributor of other people's products. Well, if I'm the person whose products they're distributing, if I'm the company who's got the products that are being distributed, I'm selling them at a wholesale price and then they're selling to the consumer at a higher price, I could get that margin myself if I could sell direct to the consumer. So I can effectively sell direct to the consumer if I acquire them. I might ultimately figure out how to take those relationships and just use them for my mic company, or I might continue to have them selling all of the diverse products that they sell. But I will now own my distribution chain and the margin, the profit margin that I have acquired by acquiring that company will increase my profits. The whole, the whole game here is how do we increase our profits? So what if you don't have a physical product, you've got uh, an intellectual property product, maybe you make courses, 
you sell information of some sort. Uh, well, if that's the case, then you still have a distribution chain because you're typically selling through affiliates who you pay 20, 30, 50% very often or more in commissions to sell your product or, or, or your service. So what if instead, or if you're paying referral fees to anybody or affiliate fees to anybody, then you can go and acquire those affiliates and then you acquire all of that profit margin. And, um, and that is vertical integration. So that's it. So the question is, how do I find those? Who's making the products, the components, the ingredients, or um, other things that you are buying? Who is providing services or being an outsourcer for the things that you are buying? You can acquire those and you will have vertically integrated your supply chain. How can you, how can you find the companies to buy, to acquire if you're looking to go down in vertical integration to, to the distribution chain? Well, that's easy. You say, who's selling my products or services? Who am I paying referral fees for referrals or to sell my products or services? Or who are the distributors who are selling my products or services to other people? And you go and acquire those. That's how you get supply chain distribution. Um, the other one that you might think about is maybe you've got a challenge and you're trying to figure out how can I level out my income? My income is erratic. I, I go and some months I sell a whole bunch of stuff to people and some months I don't. Maybe it's seasonal. I sell a whole bunch. Of, I'm an ice cream vendor and I sell a ton of ice cream in the summer months, but in the winter months, I really don't sell that much. Or I sell pool toys and I sell a lot in the summer, but not other times of the year. I sell diet stuff uh, or weight loss products. And therefore it's big at the end of the year while people are doing all their New Year's resolutions and for the first quarter, but then it falls off when they all forget about it and fall off their New Year's resolutions as the year goes on. So if I wanted to smooth out those peaks and valleys in my revenue, I would think about how could I acquire something that people are paying on a regular recurring basis. So we call this recurring revenue, and it might be every month that there's payments. That's monthly recurring revenue. We abbreviate that MRR. Or it might be every year something renews. That's annual recurring revenue. Either of them is fine, but if we could acquire a product or service or company that provided a product or service that was recurring, that was a consumable, that would be like... Uh, Maybe there's something, certainly I mentioned bottled water earlier. I consume the bottled water. If you're making this, maybe you could put me on auto ship. So is it a product that people consume more than one, more than one time, right? So if you sell, if you sell something like a bed, like a mattress, then people don't buy mattresses typically every month or every year, but they might buy bedding products more frequently. Or maybe they'll buy something that is like a, a, a scent or uh, a uh, uh, atomizer that has a recurring component or a filter for the bedroom uh, that will clean up the air and help you sleep better or a humidifier that has a filter. And that thing gets replaced on the regular basis, right? Then you've got a recurring revenue product. Or maybe you have a lawn care agency or a florist, you own a florist. And rather than just people buying flowers once in a while when the special occasion hits and they remember it, you just say, hey, wouldn't it be nice to have fresh flowers every single month in your home? We'll do that for a service of X dollars a month, right? So, so you're trying to think of how do I recurify the things that I offer right now, or if the things that I offer tend to be only one-time purchases or, or very uh, spread out periodic purchases, like a car or a mattress, then what other products or services could I acquire that do have that monthly recurring basis? How do you find them? You just think about things we just talked about, right? They're, they're easy to find when you think about that. You're just identifying what is something that has a monthly or annual recurring payment that has some consumption consumable component. That could be information like a subscription site, a periodical publication, uh, some sort of service. Could it be auto ship? It could be intellectual property so that you have access to the intellectual property. It could be a royalty based so that you're getting a royalty every time that thing is sold. But what will help you smooth the peaks and valleys that you're experiencing right now in your revenue and profits because you don't have recurring revenue? So that's really what we're talking about there. And the easiest way to, uh, to acquire it is just identify who's got it, and then you go make an offer. And again, that could be a whole company, 
or it could just be a specific asset like the atomizer, right? Or the service that's the digital marketing company that people have. Last but not least, when people are saying, uh, what are the easiest types of businesses to buy? I, I think one of the easiest is intellectual property. And a really good example, and, and, and it's not necessarily, like it might be a business because it's a business based on intellectual property, or it might be a asset that is intellectual property that has the ability to help you with innovation. Right, So the real benefit of intellectual property is that maybe you've got products or services that are a little long in the tooth and um, you've had them for a long time. And there's some competitors that have come along and are doing things differently and people are starting to take notice and it's eating away at your business. Then one of the easiest things that you can do is go and acquire that intellectual property. Intellectual property can be copyrights. It can be trademarks. It could be patents. It could also be trade dress. It could be logos. It could be brand names. It could be URLs, right? It could be any of those things. It could be trade secrets, right? You know, like the recipe to Coke or Kentucky Fried Chicken. Those are pretty valuable assets. It could be an algorithm. Uh, it could be software. All of that is intellectual property that you can bring in to breathe new life into the products and services that you offer your customers right now. And it can get them excited to continue to do business with you. It can help you retain customers longer because you've got new things to talk about. And you, then it can also reduce competition because you are buying that intellectual property, hopefully exclusively, right? Because you could buy a license to it uh, that might only have a certain vertical, or you could buy a right to it that might have a certain vertical, and it could be exclusive or non-exclusive. Ideally, it's exclusive, and then it becomes a moat that you build around your business and your customers that you've got this cool new thing that nobody else has, and it's actually protected legally because it's a copyright, trademark, patent, some of the things that I mentioned. Now, you've got amazing intellectual property. You've got amazing innovation. You are fresh. You are the hot thing on the block product or service wise that your customers want to have. And they know, like, and trust you already. And they're happy because you, beca you become somebody that has a company reputation of always looking forward, always evolving, always meeting new customer services or needs, always improving the products and services that you've got. One of the easiest ways to find intellectual property is to go to invention shows or to keep an eye on new startups in your industry. So that would mean looking at AngelList and uh, becoming a part of the startup communities that are in your industry, going to the trade shows in your industries and seeing who's advertising, who's bought a booth, who's showing up, listening to the speakers and presenters, reading the publications, the blogs, the periodicals, the newsletters in that, looking for articles about new things, looking for advertisements about new things, looking at who's the most innovative of the people that you see and staying plugged into that. And then as you see something start, see if you can acquire it or even if you can just acquire the right to it. Maybe you want to acquire the whole company, but maybe you just have to acquire that patent or that copyright or that trademark or that logo, right? Um, or that division of people that's constantly creating things. That's uh, the easiest way to find intellectual property products, and that's the easiest way to buy innovation for your company. I hope that's been helpful, and I'm Roland Frazier. That is the five, and it may have even been a bonus, so you get six, easiest ways to acquire a business.